Let's continue with the program. Our next presenter will discuss reading the Gospels in the 21st century without becoming a cyclops. So this is going to be a very interesting, uh, a very interesting trip for us, I'm sure. Dr. Jonathan Pennington is Associate Professor of New Testament Interpretation and Director of Research Doctoral Studies at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He earned a PhD in New Testament Studies from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, a Master of Divinity degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Northern Illinois University. He is a prolific author and has published numerous books and numerous articles on a wide range of topics. His research interests include the Gospels, the history of interpretation, hermeneutics, and the theological interpretation of scripture. Dr. Pennington is married to Tracy Pennington, whom he met in college in Campus Crusade for Christ, and they are the parents of six wonderful children. Let us give a very warm welcome to Dr. Jonathan Pennington. Well, I first need to explain the title, and there are two, two ways to explain it. One is the time back in the 80s when I was invited to go roller skating, and I was the only one who wore shorts. That was uh, embarrassing. And then the other time where I uh, was invited to a formal dinner by the director of an institution I knew and uh, got there and realized, I got there in my tux and realized it wasn't a formal dinner, and uh, people mistook me for a waiter the entire evening. And, I, and I, bring, I bring up those because back six months ago when we were planning this conference, Mike uh, invited me to come along and pitch to all of us that we should have these really creative titles. You know, like I was going to do How to Read the Gospels Without, he suggested, without becoming a hippie. Dr. Garrett was going to be something about, I don't know, not bludgeoning women or something. David was going to be how to not start an apocalyptic cult. And so I thought that was the plan. We all went with that. I learned this morning that no one went with that original plan. And uh, <laughs> so here I am in my tuxedo at the non-formal dinner, how to read the Gospels without becoming a cyclops. So there we go. That's okay. We'll trust the Lord in that. So anyways, it is great to be here in this beautiful church and to meet many of you that I've not met before. It's great. It's been a great pleasure for me over the last 15 years of my intellectual life to be a student of the Gospels. And looking back now, I couldn't have planned uh, a better path for myself. I mean, I love the Gospels. I feel like I, really it's a beautiful place for me to spend my life. Other options, I almost took a degree in history of science. That was a really tempting thing. And an even closer shave, I almost became a Pauline scholar. But with those years behind me, I'm, I'm happy to say that I, I'm very happy as the one who studies mostly the Gospels. I've been bitten by the Gospel zombies, and I've been transformed into a new creature as a result. And speaking of zombies and other monsters, if you do get nothing else from my presentation today, at least, I hope you can look at the handout there, at least I can rest assured that from now on you will know the proper plural form of Cyclops. It's not Cyclopses, it's Cyclopes there because it's a Greek word and those who study Greek can figure out why that might be. It ends in a C and gets the other ending. But So it's, it's a Cyclopes and you're welcome. I hope to offer a few more gems than that today, but if nothing else, at least you'll get that. And again, it was Mike's leadership that we, that we take these sort of creative titles, and it was kind of fun for me to think about what, what uh, taking it from a sort of creative approach, how should we read the Gospels without becoming like a soft cyclops? So two preliminary things, and then we'll jump into it. And again, you can see these on the handout there. First, the first question is an introductory matter of why study the Gospels at all in the 21st century? And I'd like to just offer a few thoughts on that. First of all, why so the Gospels in the 21st century? Well, first of all, I just want to suggest to you, it's because of the central place that the Gospels particularly have played uh, throughout church history uh, in all that we do. Listen to just a few comments of many that I could have pulled together from some of the leading lights of the early church. Uh, Bonaventure said, the sacred scriptures are more excellent than any other writings, and so too the Gospels are more excellent than any other part of sacred scripture. Or Augustine, said, among all divine authorities which are contained in sacred writ, the gospels rightly excel above all else. Cyril of Alexandria, a great Trinitarian theologian, said, all scripture indeed goes forth from God, but this is especially so in the gospel proclamations. Or again, he says, 
alluding to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable, but above all the rest, this is especially the case with the Holy Gospels, and we can come up with many other statements from Origen and Irenaeus and many others. As David Parker observes, a modern scholar, the four Gospels, the Tetraeungelium, is the book of earliest Christianity and down to today. Not four books, but actually one book, one codex called The Gospel, according to, according to, according to, according to. In fact, one of the places you see this is just the massive number of manuscripts from the earliest days of the church that are, the Gospels are predominant in all of those. In every language, uh, these copies of the Gospels are, all, are found all throughout. And that preoccupation uh, is, is an ancient phenomenon noted that the Gospels in all these ancient languages are, uh, exist more than uh, beyond Greek. It was translated into all these languages more than anything else. Just brief introductory, just mention of, of how central the Gospels have played in the mind of Christians. The Gospels have also played a central role in Christian worship. I've been studying this beautiful gift it's behind us, and what I can't see in them, which maybe it's in there and I, I'm not sure, is the four symbols of the evangelist. Maybe somebody who studied this more may see them in there. If they're not in there, I'm surprised because throughout all church ar architecture throughout Christian history, the four symbols of the evangelists are, are seen everywhere. I just had the opportunity to spend a couple of weeks in Ravenna, Italy, uh, which is one of the most, you know, some of the oldest churches that exist, these basilica, and there again, you know, the four symbols of the evangelists were dominant. And it's, so it's common in, in church architecture, it's common in Christian liturgy, that the gospels are, have always played the central role. And I'd suggest to you that that continues right uh, in through the 21st century as well, and that we should, as people sitting in the beginning of the 21st century, follow the habit of our forefathers and foremothers in seeing the Gospels as central. The second reason I think we should study the Gospels is that I think that the Gospels offer us, what I would suggest to you, is the most comprehensive discourse of truth or the most comprehensive kind of map of reality. I'd suggest that the Gospels in their story form as narratives enable us to understand and access truth in a particular way. It's recognized by those who consider how language functions that there are in fact many different ways that, that we can tell truth. There are many different discourses of truth telling. There's propositional doctrine. The kind of thing that is in our church bylaws or the Westminster Confession or the Baptist Faith and Message. And that's a crucial and necessary discourse of truth, but it's really only one discourse of truth. Poetry is another way that truth is told, and painting is another way that truth is to told. And story or narrative is certainly a valid way of presenting truth. And in fact, I'd suggest to you the most common one throughout the Bible. No false dichotomies here. We need all of these types, certainly, but I would recommend to you that actually story serves a particularly comprehensive way of telling truth because it engages the whole person and can deal especially with the hardest things in life, which are paradoxes. Story alone can hold in tension things that seem to be opposites because that's the complex reality of life. As Kevin Van Hooser has said, propositional theology, so traditional doctrines, by contrast, risk reading scripture as if one size fits all, as if there was only one kind of fit. Yet, he says, the Spirit has not seen fit to inspire only one kind of text in the Bible. There's, in fact, more than one map of reality. The proof is there's no such thing as an all-purpose map. So as you think about Jefferson County, Kentucky here where we are today, that there are many different maps we could make of it. Maps of the water tables, maps of the electric lines, maps of, of uh, property uh, tax zones, maps of voting records. Not, none of these are the comprehensive map of reality. We need many maps. And so too, story is one of these crucial types of map to help us understand reality, and I think the Gospels give us that in spades. And a third and final reason I think we should be studying the Gospels, and they're worth our while, is that we are, after all, interested in Christianity, that is, with Christ in there. And therefore, our greatest focus should always be on Jesus Christ, who he is, which I'd suggest to you is most fully depicted and most beautifully depicted in the bulk of the New Testament, the head of the New Testament, the beginning of the New Testament, the four Gospels.
Hugely important distinction has been observed here between the two twins that are born out of the second temple period, or we could say the first century. Two twins are born out of the Jewish mother, rabbinic Judaism and early Christianity. And one of the most important distinctions between those two, and Jewish scholars like uh, Jacob Noiser and others have pointed this out, is that the rabbinic Jewish tradition continues and is a people who focus on a book and a tradition of the, the stories and the, especially the teachings that are recorded in this book, the Mishnah, the Torah, and then the Mishnah, that is regulative. The New Testament, Christianity, focuses primarily on a person. Christianity dies or, or rises or falls or lives or dies based on what you understand about not the teachings per se, though those are important, but on whether you accept this person of Jesus for who he is. That is a radical difference between Christianity and any other religion in the world. And so I'd suggest to you that this is part of the reason why the Gospels are so important and so worth our study, because they give us this beautiful, powerful, full-orbed, central depiction of who Jesus is, who is this, the focus of what it means to be a Christian. And the second introductory point then, more comically, so then wh that's why we need the Gospels. Why stay away from Cyclopses? So why, <laughs> to bring back in this part of it, well, as we know, Cyclopses, Cyclop there I said it, Cyclopes, uh, they don't get as much airtime as zombies do in our current culture. But we, I think we know that they are bad baddies and they are ones to avoid. We can think of some famous Cyclopes of old, of Greek mythology, the sons of Uranus and Gaia, brothers of the Titans. We can think of especially Homer's Odyssey and Polyphemus, the giant who murders this, uh, the, he, his uh, star-crossed lover. He's, he's jealous of this uh, woman he loves, this nymph, and kills her lover. And then Odysseus blinds him. So we, we know these are brutish, uneducated, unrefined uh, creatures. And what I want to use that as a metaphor today to go into my first point is to say we don't want to read in those sort of ways, certainly brutish, uneducated, but more specifically, we don't want to read in short-sighted, monochromatic, or non-depth perception ways. And this is what I want to talk about with you in my brief time together. So if you're there on the handout, there are, there are a number of ways we might accidentally read like a cyclops, but I want to suggest to you four cycloptic if I can create a word today, cycloptic readings that we should avoid. The first is this. The first cycloptic reading we should avoid is reading everything, including the Gospels, completely through Pauline lenses, or maybe more appropriate, a Pauline monocle, if you're, if you're a cyclops. <laughs> By all accounts, the most important theologian of the Christian faith is the great apostle Paul. He was a missionary, church planter, defender of the gospel, prophet, martyr, inspired by God to write nearly half of the 27 books of the New Testament. His writings are hugely important. They form crucial aspects of our understanding of Orthodox Christianity, and there's no way in which we can or should diminish his foundational role as a teacher, apostle, and theologian. Yet, I would suggest to you today that precisely because of his importance, and maybe especially for those of us here who are Protestants, whose tradition came into existence because of a rediscovery of some of Paul's teachings, and Romans in particular, I'm afraid that we often end up reading all the Bible, including the Gospels, through a too narrowly construed Pauline lens or monocle. I think it's true of the Reformed tradition. I think it's true of the Baptistic traditions. I think it's especially true of the Lutheran traditions. But I think it's, it's true for Protestantism in general. Now, we've got to think really carefully about what I'm saying here. On the one hand, Orthodox Christianity has understood, always understood that all of Scripture is God-breathed and authoritative and at the same time unified in its teaching, yet simultaneously that the authority and inspiration of scripture recognizes that scripture comes to us through real people, human people, who have their own language, their own specific perspectives, their own purposes, 
and people who are situated in particular historical situations. Now, those true truths exist in an antinomy, in a, in a paradoxical relationship with each other. Both the universality of Scripture is speaking over across historical situations down to us today, and also the historical specificity of Scripture. Now, on the one hand, the inspired nature of Scripture means that what Paul teaches transcends space and time. It is Holy Scripture. And at the same time, the real human production of Scripture means that the different parts of the writings of Scripture we recognize have different purposes and different perspectives that are, in fact, historically conditioned. Many simple examples come to mind. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Most of us did not do that today because we'd recognize that there's something historically conditioned about that holy scripture. And we could come up with many other examples, and there are many debates, of course, about which, is, which things are historically conditioned and which are not. But specifically, my point here is that I would like to point out that Paul's epistles as holy scripture, quite differently than the gospels, are occasional in nature. They are occasional in nature. What that means is they are limited in their scope and are written to specific situations, usually quite polemically charged situations, while at the same time they're universally speaking. The significance of this is important, I think, because the Gospels, although they are also real human documents, of course, that do come out of historical situations as well, I was just to you, they're not nearly so occasional in nature that the epistles are. They are deeply reflective, theologically discipleship-focused, comprehensive narrative accounts that, especially in the case of Matthew, Luke, and John, were actually written quite a while after the events, and they're meant to provide a foundational and comprehensive catechetical instruction for Christian disciples. They are, in the language of one scholar, premeditated foundational documents. They are like what I, what I like to call the Mayflower Compact of Christianity, not a letter written home to a friend. Therefore, and so I hope you can feel the tension of what I'm getting at, both the universality and the specificity at the same time as we think about these different parts of Scripture. Therefore, it's a problem, I would suggest to you, that when we read the gospel, if we read the gospels as if they were epistles in the same way that we rightly read the epistles, that is, with a narrow focus, with a singular pointedness to them, that they are making a, a logical, polemical argument, and that they are to be distilled down into doctrinal statements. That's not how the Gospels work, I would suggest to you, in any of those ways. They are not occasional documents. They are not written to just some polemical situation. There's always some elements of that. But they are, in fact, meant to be universal foundational documents. That's why they stand at the head of the New Testament canon, to orient Christian disciples to what it means to be a Christian, which I would suggest to you, again, is a little different than when you read the Holy Scriptural writings that come through the Apostle Paul, which are very specific in their situations generally. And we can uh, come back to that in a Q&A if you'd like. Second potential uh, cycloptic reading, reading the Gospels as if they were pre-resurrection documents. I want you to ponder this with me for a minute as well, because I think this is quite common. Very common especially in some circles, it is to view the Gospels as they are sort of the raw data of what happened, and then Paul of, and the rest of the New Testament is the theological interpretation. So the Gospels are sort of the stuff, the history, and then the rest of the New Testament is the interpretation. I, that's, that's an understandable view, but I think it's mistaken. It's understandable because the Gospels are, in fact, historical in nature. They are desiring to convey some historical things that happen in real space-time, and they do, the content they cover is almost entirely of Jesus' pre-resurrection uh, existence, his earthly life. Additionally, for some of the Gospels' teachings, that pre-resurrection reality ends up being pretty important to recognize. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus tells the, his disciples to only go to the lost tribes of Israel, that's clearly not going to be the universal, long-term, post-resurrection command. In fact, in that same book, he's going to 
modify that with what we call the Great Commission, where he sends his disciples to all the nations. So we can even recognize there, there aren't very many of those, it turns out, but there are a few spots we can say, okay, that's clearly reflecting something of a sort of pre-resurrection reality. But that's quite rare, and even those need sort of careful thought. I would suggest to you instead that even though the bulk of the gospel's story recounts events that happened before the resurrection, that universe-changing event, the gospels themselves, just let, let this sink in and you'll see it's immediately true, the gospels themselves are post-resurrection documents. They are written after knowing the end of the story, after the stone table is cracked. They are the... Uh, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe after the last battle has already been written in some real sense. Indeed, as noted a moment ago, they are written quite a bit after the resurrection, more than the rest of the New Testament documents by and large, providing more space for theological reflection and application. As I always tell my students, I spend most of my time in Matthew, but all the Gospels this is the case for, when you're reading them, what you need to realize is Matthew has been thinking about what he wrote there for 20, 30, 40, even if you take a very early date, 30 or 40 years, he's been preaching those sermons, thinking about the events that were witnessed and what they mean for a long time. This is his magnum opus. This is not him sitting down and, and hearing some angry situation and writing off a, an angry missive. This is a thoughtful, long-term, comprehensive document that is all post-resurrection in its formation. So the Gospels are post-resurrection. They are theologically reflective documents. They have very sophisticated, refined, and well-honed, practical, Christological points to make that nobody at the time understood. Right? None of Jesus' disciples had any idea what he was talking about almost the entire time. Right? And yet, when the Gospels speak, they are making very sophisticated Christological claims that indicate, again, that they are clearly post-resurrection documents. They cannot just be used as the raw data for, data for Pauline theology or treated as mere husks to get to the real meat of systematic theology better articulated somewhere else. The Gospels are not the precursor for the real thing. They are, I would suggest to you, the most profound kind of theology. They are this comprehensive narrative kind of theology, virtue forming, historical and theological all at once. The central and comprehensive role that the Gospels demand and have possessed stands strongly against any attempt, I would suggest to you, to diminish their role into some kind of pre-Christian dispensation or that they have a kind of primitive theological understanding that Paul develops later. A couple of, of implications of this immediately come to mind. First, they not only have an important role in our theological formulations, they probably need to have a central role in our understanding of what Christian theology is. And again, all these things are held in tension. I'm in no way diminishing the central role that Pauline theology plays, especially for us as Protestants, maybe. But at the same time, I would suggest to you that it's not an accident that these post-resurrection documents that form the bulk of the New Testament should play a, a very central role in what we think Christianity is. A second implication of this is that when reading the, and interpreting the gospel stories of things that happen in Jesus' life before his resurrection, so when you're reading the gospels, you're reading stories that happened before his resurrection, I think it's entirely appropriate and even necessary to interpret those stories before his resurrection in light of what we know happened after his death and resurrection. Because the fuller reality of the whole story can and should color our understanding of the earlier parts. Except for the, just think with me about this, except for the very first time someone hears the story that Jesus lived, taught, died, and resurrected. Most of us probably can't even remember the first time we heard that. Right? But except for the very first time, every time you hear the stories about Jesus, you know that essential fact. Right? That's, and I would suggest to you that by the time the Gospels are written, almost everyone who's reading them, except for maybe the very first time the converted Corinthian stonemason hears it, but even before he hears the Gospels read, I bet he has heard the basics of the story that Jesus has died and risen. Right? So in other words, the Gospels are received 
already as with an awareness of what the end story is. And I would suggest to you, they're definitely written with that perspective of what the end story is. So let me give you an example. Matthew chapter 4, very familiar uh, temptation narrative there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When we're reading the temptation story in Matthew 4, I think we need to re read that, not merely as something that happened historically, though it's certainly that, but as a post-resurrection informed story. So that, just a couple of things off the top of my head, so that Satan's temptation for Jesus to throw himself down and be saved, and Satan's offer of all the kingdoms of the world, those things mean something a lot more profoundly when you recognize what actually happens at the end of the story. That Jesus chooses not to save himself, and yet God raises him from the dead. That Jesus chooses not to bow down and take the offer of Satan to have all the kingdoms, and when he's raised from the dead, what precisely does he, what is he given? that he tells us at the end of that same story, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Do you see? So that when you're reading Matthew 4, the best reading is going to recognize that you know what the end of the story is and you can read it and it's meant to be read in that way, I'd suggest to you. One of the greatest evidences, I think, of what I'm suggesting to you, the truth of it, comes from the whole way that that fourth climactic concluding gospel, the Gospel of John, what I like to call the Gospel for Dummies, the way it reads, one of the many ways that the Gospel of John is both the simplest and the most profound, that's, what, that's what's amazing about the Gospel of John, is that it takes many of these same stories, but it front loads for us how you're supposed to read them. And do you remember this first primary story in chapter 2 of John where Jesus cleanses the temple? And do you remember the, the comment? One of the things to really pay attention to in the wonderful Gospel of John is when the narrator comes in really in your face and says, here's how you're supposed to read this. That happens a lot in John. It doesn't happen as much in the synoptic tradition. And in John chapter 2, at the end of that cleansing temple, do you remember what the comment is in chapter 2, verse 22? It says there that after the resurrection, then the disciples understood that Jesus meant the temple of his body, not the temple that he's standing in front of. I would suggest to you that's John's way of saying, friends, here's how you read the Gospels. You need to understand that understanding will only come with the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is given, John of all people makes very clear, only because of the death, resurrection, and ascension, who gives the Spirit that enables understanding. In other words, to read the Gospels well means to read them as post-resurrection documents because that's how they're intended to be read and were received. Third, cycloptic reading to avoid, reading without understanding how narratives work. I've already noted that I think narrative is a, a beautiful and powerful form of truth-telling, in my opinion, the most comprehensive one. It's important also to observe that the vast majority of Holy Scripture comes to us again in this narrative form, yet it's remarkable that at the same time that most people in the modern world don't really know how to read and interpret stories very well. Well, actually, I need to qualify that. I think naturally we all love stories and know how to read them pretty well. What happens is when we go to try to read the Bible stories, and especially if you have theological training, then you become a horrible story reader. <laughs> and that's a, it's a sad truth, right? Is that the sort of the worst things that you can do to learn to be a good story reader is to learn uh, how to read the Bible in some ways because it kind of kills good story reading, which is natural in us. So it what I would say to you is that in my experience, many readers of the gospel narratives don't read them well, and they read them in a couple of wrong ways or ways that are very cycloptic. They either read gospel narratives like an epistle, or they read them with no direction at all, what I like to call the whatever strikes me hermeneutic. Like an epistle, here's a mistaken way of reading the gospels. When you read them like an epistle, what that means is treating stories as if they're merely means to an end, to get to a doctrinal nugget or what I like to call a theological bullion cube. You know, you've sort of boiled down, instead of eating the wonderful bowl of soup, you're just given this little tablet on your mouth. Here's a, you know, essence of, 
theology or something. And, and we, we tend to read the stories as if we just need to kind of press them down till we can get the real meaning of them, and then we can discard the husk of the narrative. I'd suggest to you, friends, that misses the whole point of a story. A story is not to be discarded. Otherwise, 75% of the Bible is now we need to be done with. Right? The point of a story is to invite you into an experience because of the way that story truth tells. The form and the content are essential. One of the many, uh, I mean, one of the most insightful people that's helped me understand this, I'm going to come to it in other ways as well, but it's kind of solidified this, is Eleanor Stump, the philosopher, uh, Christian philosopher at, in uh, St. Louis, in her uh, book about suffering and the problem of evil, has this brilliant exposition, this discussion of two different ways of knowing, which she typifies with two of the great monastic traditions, that is the Franciscan tradition and the Dominican tradition. And she talks about the Franciscan way of knowing and the Dominican way of knowing, and you know, I can't even do justice, I, because it's so wonderful to read how she does this, but the Franciscan way is knowing through story and experience, the Dominican way is knowing through logical argumentation. And of course, it's a both and, we need both. Hear, hear me clearly on that. But again, I would suggest to you here that this is the point, we need both those ways of knowing. And she applies it to the problem of evil, which is a great example of the necessity of a Franciscan way of knowing. Because when you take the problem of evil, if God is all good and in control, and yet there's evil in the world, those are irreconcilable if you just line them out as logical arguments. You need something like the book of Job, notice, in a poetic narrative form is the Bible's kind of attempt to answer something like the problem of evil, which you cannot answer with merely Dominican sort of systematic theology. You need something more to do so. And I suggest to you, this is a problem when we read the Gospels as if we just need to boil them down in a Dominican sort of way. The other mistaken way to read the Gospels is, again, what I call this whatever strikes me method. It's very common, uh, whether it's from the pulpit or in a home Bible study or just in personal reading, that we don't really know what to do with Gospel stories. So when we read them, we just kind of take away from them whatever struck me about it, right? So, and let me say, that's not all bad. I mean, I really commend the very personal reading of scripture. That's the, that's the end goal of what we're going for. Um, that's very positive. But on the other hand, it can be problematic because as uh, Michael was saying in the first hour, I mean, there needs to be some guidance, some direction, tradition, and some principles to help us read well. Positively, so that's, those are some wrong ways to read. Positively, to read narratives very simply, and I've written a book on this that if you want to read more on it, but if you, if you want to read the Gospels well, I'd suggest to you, positively, it's just recognizing the basic way that stories work. Stories have a setting, they have some tension that arises, that tension comes to a climactic point, it gets resolved, and then there's some sort of falling action or moral of the story. That's how every story works, universally. If it doesn't have that, it's not a story by definition. And I want to suggest to you that that simple knowledge of that will really help you because when you read gospel stories or any stories of the Bible, what you want to pay attention to is what's the tension and what's the resolution that's being provided for you. Rather than just this sort of nugget-based approach, you read it and, oh, okay, that's that and that's that. You need to let the story be what it is, experience as a story, and then when you go to analyze it, which is a good thing to do, you pay attention to what its tension is and what is the resolution. So let's return to my example of Matthew 4. Again, the temptation narrative. Reading that like, just like an epistle, which is a mistaken way, I think, would be to maybe read the first verse, chapter 4, verse 1, comment on its doctrinal or historical significance. Read the second verse, comments on its doctrinal or historical significance or its applicational significance, and go through it. Not a retelling of the story, not a feeling of the tension that is clearly there. Do you notice in the temptation narrative, it's three successively intense situations of these temptations, and then it resolves at the end. Um, th that's what it means to read it well, but we tend to read it in this sort of very flat epistolary way. Or to take the whatever strikes me reading, we might read it and say, fasting is good, right? From verse two, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, or 
there's no way you could fast for 40 days. Maybe that's the whatever strikes you about it. Or if someone fasted that long, I'd expect they'd have delusions as well, right? Or maybe you read it and say, Jesus doesn't really care that much for bread. Maybe he had celiac disease that was undiagnosed or something, and that's why he doesn't do it. Or these poor, dumb, ancient people still believed in demons. Or angels minister to people, verse 11, right? That's what it says at the end. Or that's cool, Satan and Jesus can fly or teleport. Or when we're tempted, we need to use scripture. Or any number of other things. My suggesting to you, in short, is that if we just have a whatever strikes me method, then there's no way to really adjudicate which of those readings are good and more, more or less beneficial, right? We need something more than just reading it like an epistle and more than just reading it whatever strikes me. We need a basic understanding of how narratives work. Fourth and final cycloptic way of reading to avoid is what I call reading in a monochrome or myopic way, reading only historically, only literarily, only theologically, only with my personal agenda. Reality, as we know and as we get older, is very complex and multi-layered. And in fact, there are many metaphors that approximate the truth. Our knowledge, our understanding is always limited, but there are many avenues or metaphors or discourses or planes of understanding or insights that help us understand reality, but we will always understand in, in part, in a darkened glass, as Paul himself says. What we learn, I would suggest to you, from a text, like a Gospels text, depends entirely on which of those questions we ask of it, which of those lines of insight, which of those uh, planes of discourse, which of those tools we use. If we ask historical questions of a text, we're going to get historical answers. If we ask literary questions of a text, we're going to get literary answers. If we ask theological, we get theological. Ask psychological tech questions, we get psychological answers. Ask homiletical, we get those. Worldview, spiritual, meditative, social scientific, grammatical, philosophical, anthropological, linguistic, moral. Whatever questions you ask of a text are the kind of answers you'll get. And that's okay. The cycloptic or myopic problem that we often have is that we as humans all tend to read in a monochromatic or non-depth perception way a singular view only. That's human nature. And I think it's actually particularly scholarly nature, I would suggest to you. Because scholars, professional students of the Bible, especially care about the proper method and the producing of results from a method. And as a result, in scholarly discussion, I've observed over the years, that we often latch on to one approach that has yielded some helpful, interesting, insightful, and hopefully publishable uh, results. And then myopically and cyclopically, we read the Gospels or whatever it is only that way. Whether it be grammatically, historically, social scientifically, whatever it is, and especially if we have some narrow and more pointed counter traditional reading, we're especially going to say that's the only way to read them because it has a lot of, it's got a lot of sort of uh, unction behind it. Those have the most potential of what I call the totalizing effect, the tendency to take one perspective and make it everything. And I think this is true of human nature, but again, I think it's especially true of scholarly nature. So let's use our example again from Matthew 4. The tendency for different readers is to use all different sorts, uh, the, the tendency, sorry, is for different readers to use different sorts of questions about the text, which is good, but they tend to only ask certain questions and therefore only get certain answers. So again, if you ask historical questions about Matthew 4, you're going to get geographical answers and questions about where this was and where the temple was in relation to where the wilderness was. Those are all fine questions, but that's only one set of questions. If you ask social scientific questions, you might discuss what's the value of bread in the ancient world? What's the role of temple in society? What does it mean to bow down and worship as Satan invites Jesus to do in terms of someone else's allegiance? Those are all good questions to ask and they give interesting answers, but they're not the only ones. You could ask theological questions of the text. Christological ones, what is the significance of him being called the son of God? Redemptive historical questions about why is the kingdom mentioned? Typological questions, 
What's the significance of there being 40 days that he fasted, 40 days and nights that he fasted? The significance of the wilderness, the significance that there's a testing and attempting happening in the wilderness. That should be ringing Old Testament bells for you. The questions of the identity of the Son of God, who is Jesus, who is Israel, right? You can ask personal applicational questions. The importance of using scripture when you're tempted. The reality of what seems to be right might be wrong. The nature of temptation that was before Jesus seems to be not to do something wrong, but to use his own rights outside of God's will. I was just used what's going on in the temptations. The point is that a cycloptic or myopic reading will only tend to ask one of those questions, or maybe a sum of them, rather than recognizing that all of those are good questions to ask, and all of them provide beneficial answers. And the real danger is that, again, our tendency is to get latched on to one way of reading and think that that's the only way. And that last point leads directly into then the last thing I want to say today. I want to give you something positive. And this is the reading too wide. I'd never want to leave you with merely exhortation against cyclopicity. I just made that word up as well. This would serve you only partially, and who knows, someone might put a stick in that one eye of yours, and then you'll really be in trouble. Instead, I want to leave you with some suggestions for a two-eyed approach to reading the Gospels in the 21st century. Two suggestions to be exact, one for the left and one for the right eye, if you will. So good two-eyed Gospel reading should be first, reading with multiple lenses and tools. As I just mentioned, there's a demonstrable human tendency toward totalizing, but we do this only to our own detriment. Much better is to fully embrace the riches of Holy Scripture through using multiple tools to approach the Gospels. Different tools give different readings of the same object. For example, you think about a body of water and all the various tools you might use to analyze it. You could analyze its color and appearance, its parts per million of all kinds of different things, its pH level, its chlorine level, its saltness or freshness, its swimability, its drinkability. You could ask what feeds this body of water, what does this body of water feed, what life does it support. Those are all different questions or different tools you could use to analyze one thing. Or to change it and get it back to our seeing metaphor, multiple lenses. There are telescopes, there are microscopes. There are electron microscopes, there are binoculars, there are telephoto lenses, there are wide angle lenses, there's digital versus film. I was with my son somewhere uh, the other day at the airport and there was something that was, there was someone was selling film or the, and my son said, what's film? I thought, wow, okay, we have definitely turned the digital camera uh, corner here. There are stills versus movies, there are different shutter speeds, there are different resolutions, there are bifocals, there are convex and concave lenses. All of these ways of sight will enable you to see differently. So too, there are many different beneficial approaches to analyzing, reading, and interpreting the Gospels. Literary, historical, social scientific, grammatical, psychological, philosophical, aritogenic, virtue forming, trinitarian, canonical, soteriological, educational. So turn to our Matthew 4 example once more. If we read literarily, that famous story, we might recognize the power of the three, right? This porridge is just right. <laughs> I mean, that's universal in stories, is threes. That's not an accident that most stories have three parts, and so too in the temptation narrative. We might notice, literally, that there's a rising of location that goes throughout that story. First temptation happens on the wilderness floor, the second at the temple pinnacle, the third on a high, high mountain. We might recognize literarily that there are a variety of titles that are used for the tempter there, right? Peirazon and Diablos, and uh, there are all these different titles that are used. It's not just Satanas, right? There are all these different ones. That's interesting. We might notice that this story exists in a context. It comes at the end of Matthew's climactic prologue right before the G beginning of Jesus' ministry. That's important to recognize. All literary readings. We might consider from a literary perspective how this story finds poetic parallel in the last night of Jesus' earthly ministry life where he's also tempted of a sorts in the garden and how through not giving into temptation in death he again is then given all the things that Satan promised him in his resurrection and ascension. We might recall literarily how the get behind me Satan appears again doesn't it on the lips of Jesus to poor beloved Peter. 
in his moment of stumbling, or one of his many moments of stumbling, and that we're not, that's not an accident that those same words appear. Or we might recognize, very interestingly, by reading literarily, that many times Jesus' enemies throughout Matthew, the Pharisees and other religious leaders, come to test slash tempt Jesus, the very same word that, was used, that Satan did at the beginning. Subtle, but very powerful to recognize that there's a parallelism going on there. Those are just literary readings. I haven't done anything with canonical or theological readings. Canonically, theologically, we could think about the mimicking that's happening here of Israel's 40-year wilderness temptation, which they failed, note, as the Son of God, but Jesus succeeded. We might think about the fact that the order of Jesus' temptations in Matthew matches exactly the order of the temptations in Exodus that Israel failed. Hunger, putting God to the test, and idolatry, the exact same order of temptations. We might recognize that Matthew 4 and Jesus' successful defeating a temptation is the reverse order of Genesis 3, 2 and 3, where the first Adam, human, was in paradise and then was tempted by this same personal agent and even personal agent of evil. He failed, was banished to the wilderness, and now here, this second Adam is in the wilderness, defeats temptation, and will open paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. And we might also consider theologically the significance of wilderness in the Bible, the significance of temple in the Bible, the significance of mountain, and it goes on and on. Jesus as the suffering servant here. Jesus as the obedient son. Jesus as the true Israel. Jesus as the second person of the Trinity. Those are all valid readings of this multi-layered story. And we might also read it personally and applicationally. We must not overcome, we must overcome Satan by being alert and making good use of scripture ourselves. I think that's an entirely appropriate reading. We can be free from the bondage of Satan's accusations because Jesus stood in our place as the second Adam and did not give Satan an inch of foothold in his life. We can read it recognizing that Jesus can help us in our deepest struggles because he has fully tasted our human experience of temptation. And it goes on and on. Those are just a few readings that we can do by reading with a depth perception, not myopically. And let me give an important note of clarification here. I'm not saying by this that any particular interpretation is going to answer, or any answer to these questions is necessarily right or equally beneficial. What I am saying is that there are many good and beneficial questions and many good and beneficial answers one should ask of the Gospels. I'm speaking here about the many different approaches. The question that is a different one of how one comes to the best and most beneficial answers is a different one, and that relates to the realm that we've already heard a little bit about today, hermeneutics. Here I'll only reiterate what I've already suggested, that the best interpretations of narratives will be sensitive to how stories work. I adhere to the perspective of someone like Umberto Eco, who recognizes both that texts have intents, they have an intent, texts do, and that they, by that, they give guidance and provide parameters of the many potentially good readings that individuals situated in their own situated context might understand. So that's my understanding of how these things work. Nor am I saying that every tool or approach of, equal, uh, of reading is equally beneficial. So I gave you a number of those, but just like a pair of bifocals is for reading is far more helpful than having an infrared spectrometer in daily life, I would suggest to you that there are times where an infrared spectrometer is really handy, I'm sure. I've never used one. Or a you know, timing belt Gate, you know, just like a Phillips screwdriver is much better than a timing belt adjusting tool for a late model Honda. Those are both important tools, but some of them are more beneficial and more practical. I would say, too, that many of these tools of reading are better than others. That is more beneficial literary readings, canonical theological readings, and especially personal applicational readings. Final thing, then my final positive, the other I, is reading. There's a beautiful providence that Michael mentioned some of these same things. Reading to understand, to stand under. So finally and most importantly, I would suggest to you that good two-eyed readers of the Gospels will read to understand so that we might stand under. To stand under God's direction with humility and teachability and personal receptivity. 
Elsewhere, I've argued that good reading in the Bible entails three kinds of reading, informational reading, theological reading, and transformational reading. Transformational reading is what I'm talking about here. Transformational reading highlights the fact that there is a God-intended goal for our reading of Holy Scripture, that we be formed and transformed into different people by the power of the Spirit into the image of Christ, who is the exact representation of God the Father. That's the end game or goal of God giving us Holy Scripture, not mere head knowledge for theologians to have job security through endless debates and posturing. The end game or telos of all of our labors to read the Gospels must be greater knowledge of God, which leads to transformation of our very being in relationship to others in the world. I would suggest to you that if we're not reading the Bible and seeking to live in the community of faith for those reasons, then I think we're wasting our time. Why? Why waste your time in the Bible if you're not reading it for personal transformation? The point of understanding is not merely to give me knowledge and facts about the Bible or theology by which we can beat other people up with, which happens on all sides. Understanding is always a means to an end, transformation transformation of me as an individual, transformation of our local community and our church, transformation through the church of the world, all in accordance with God's kingdom. To understand is to be brought to a place of standing under a posture of open-heartedness and open-handedness to God. So to conclude today, in answer to the question set before us, how to read the Gospels in the 21st century, I simply just want to give you an invitation to simply do that. Pick them up and read them. And do so with hearts and both eyes wide open to the treasures old and new that are brought forth from the treasure house of the Gospels in every century. Peace to you. Thanks. Sure. Ten, ten, at least ten minutes. We have at least ten minutes for questions, so, or maybe even fifteen. All right, we have one back here. It seems that both presentations thus far would be agreeable to those with various views of the infallibility of the Bible, for example, inerrant, authoritative, or incarnational. Would you give some background as to how you reached your own conviction in this area and compare and contrast how holding these various or differing convictions would impact one's reading of the Bible, yeah. particularly in relation to what's been said so far? Yeah. That's a nice small question. Thanks. That's good. That's fair. Um, well, I hope I can answer it and feel free to jump back in if I'm not. I mean, I do hold to you know, the inspiration and authoritative and fallibility of the Word of God, and that's part of my convictional personal stance and also my confessional environment in which I'm glad to be. And so what, and of course, uh, what all the implications of that requires a much d larger double clicking. And, and I'm glad to see that in, within the evangelical world of which I'm part, that there's some good, healthy dialogue going on about different views that are still within the realm of a, of a uh, high view of scripture, we might say, but recognizing that it's complex. And I, you know, my Bird was involved in a book, and uh, many others have as well. So uh, recognizing the complexity of it, um, I'm happy to confess my sort of evangelical alliance within it. Um, if you're asking implications of it, I've certainly wrestled with that for many years now, especially in Gospels, because we have the joy and angst, as I like to say, of having four Gospels, not just one, which is on the one hand an amazing gift you know i mean it, it's not only gives you the ability to be bifocal but quadrifocal <laughs> right i mean far beyond just being cycloptic you can actually see with four eyes um when you get to read the gospels and at the same time it creates some problems doesn't it historically because there are um ways in which the gospels are hard to figure out how all of them fit together and historically that is Theologically, not so much, I think. I mean, even though I do believe there are different theological perspectives in each of the four Gospels, I think they sing in a, in a you know, SATB, beautiful harmony, you know, a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass sort of harmony. But uh, historically, 
it's, it can be problematic sometimes to try to figure out exactly how the Gospels fit together. And of course, I'm not alone in that. That issue goes back to the earliest days of the church where they wrestled with this. Augustine spent many years of his life writing a major book trying to figure all those out, and he actually spent most of his time just in the passion narratives because that's where it gets the stickiest. The wicked is the stickiest there in terms of how many angels were at the tomb, at what hour was he crucified, all those sort of things. So I, I wonder if this is the kind of question you're asking. So, But I will just say that this is, as I think about the convictional stance I have about the inspiration of Scripture as it relates to such historical situations, I find it to be a very freeing thing, not a constraining one. That is a high view of scripture in the sense that um, I will do whatever I can to wrestle to try to fit together the scriptures historically in their details. Um, but at the end of the day, I also don't feel like I have to be able to understand everything or fit it all together or that the authority of scripture is dependent on my ability to historically reconstruct <laughs> their harmonization, which is part of the hubris of the modern enlightenment, isn't it? that I, you know, thank you Descartes, all the way down to today, I am the source of ultimate authority because truth is found in cognition. I don't hold to that. I'm not a modernist in that sense. So, um, so if I, is that the kind of question you're asking? How does uh, high view of scripture relate to being a gospel scholar? Or maybe you want to follow up on that? Well, it seems to be going back to Dr. Bird's question about the reader. That's one uh, of those places that oftentimes we start with is with a presupposition about what the text is. And so that lens yeah. strongly uh, impacts, if I, I would even say it's the strongest impact on the others in terms of what is authoritative concerning the person, Got it. Okay. even in terms of the text itself, even in terms of what text we will allow, what questions we yeah. will allow yeah. ourselves to ask in those other areas. And so I, I guess I'm Great. trying to one gain a perspective on how does keeping those things alive in one's mind and how to do that with, without uh, merely being relativistic. Yeah, that's great. So I'm sorry, you weren't asking the historical questions. That was a bonus track there on the go. DVD. Sorry, but yeah, you're asking the hermeneutical. Yeah, that's great. So boy, I've wrestled with that for years as well. Now for me, um, where I, what I've come to understand, and I'm still on a journey, of course, in understanding these things, is that... Um, this, very similar to what Michael was saying, that this is where tradition is so important as well. And especially for Protestants, this is a, there's a real antinomy. It's, it'd be far easier to hold to an equal weighting of tradition and scripture. That, and I don't mean to be dismissive of it, that it's easier. I mean, I respect that there's a lot of um, solidity in one sense by holding to a view like that, which would be more traditional and Roman Catholic view. It's got its own problems and that the tradition itself ends up being varying, right? So that's... But I think Protestants particularly, and maybe especially low church Protestants in which I am incarnated, uh, that the, the dilemma is that we recognize the authority of scripture as being the primary one, yet also recognize that we are part of a great tradition that is what I would call the, concili the great traditions, the conciliar creeds, the creeds upon which all branches of Chris Orthodox Christendom hold to, um, so through Chalcedon, I guess, at least. And that there's a tension that I think the, that we have to live with that Scripture is the authority, yet our reading of Scripture is rightly constrained and guided by creedal orthodoxy. And that takes a while to feel comfortable with that. I'm quite comfortable with that now. Um, but what I, and how I think about it is uh, with the great philosopher SpongeBob, uh, which is that I always think of sort of Sandy's uh, if you know SpongeBob, uh, you know, so there's a squirrel who's a scientist who lives underwater with all these sea creatures. And so for her to live underwater, she has this dome of air, right? That, so it's, you know, the inverse fish tank. And I think of creedal orthodoxy like Sandy, the squirrel's dome. It doesn't generate readings of scripture, but it provides what are the ones in which you can breathe orthodox oxygen. And so I think there's a large, there's a large number of readings that one might gain from reading scripture, but there are readings that are by definition outside of orthodoxy, and they just are. So an Arian reading of John 1, no matter what your exegesis is, is unorthodox. And I'm entirely comfortable with that because as a truly great theologian, Rich Mullins, said, 
about the creed, I did not make it, it is making me. And so I'm happy to submit to the great Orthodox tradition and, and recognizing that there are many readings of a text, but there is a constraint beyond the, that goes over them in a Sandy the Squirrel kind of way. Is that what you're wanting? We could talk more. Yeah, Th sure. Thank you, though. Good questions. Could you expound a little bit more about the repercussions of reading the Gospels through Pauline lenses? Um, I know Richard Bauckham has done some work on that, but um, what's your thoughts on that? Richard, do you? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he was my PhD supervisor. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, yeah, boy, and again, another thing I've been wrestling with for years and I try to be really careful about, and I was trying to be nuanced today, but, uh, you know, I understand that, especially maybe the first time hearing it may not have come across nuanced enough, but no diminishing of any part of Holy Scripture by any means, by what I'm saying, including the Apostle Paul and his writings. The, but the point is that, I like to give the example of Amos. No, nobody uses Amos, the book of Amos, as the key to understand all of the Bible. Right? I should not say nobody. Does anyone here use the book of Amos? <laughs> probably, okay, um, probably not. So, and indeed, um, it's funny, we all do use something, though. And when you look at the, those of us who are Protestants, if you look at the Protestant forefathers, they were very explicit. Both Calvin and Luther, I've got these great quotes from them. Great, I actually disagree with these quotes, but they're very telling. They'll both say things like, he who understands Romans will have a key to unlock all of Holy Scripture. Those are quotes from Calvin and Luther. And that's, of course, part of the big part of the Protestant tradition. I don't agree with that, actually. I think that's um, for the reasons I've suggested briefly here and I lay out more. But that's not to say Romans isn't hugely important and that the doctrine of, that Romans teaches is absolutely essential, I, absolutely foundational for me and the, our whole tradition. But at the same time, that's not the same thing as saying it's the key to unlock all of Scripture. I'm suggesting let's have that discussion. What is the key to unlock all of Scripture? And at least if we can have that discussion, I think a valid option is the Gospels. And that, that's the argument I would like to make. Um, recognizing that just like Calvin and Luther did, that by saying Romans is the key, they're not diminishing any other part, right? They're just saying some things are more operative. And so that, that's, sort of that, that's part of the issue. I think maybe your question also relates to the, what are the implications? Again, I think the implications are that we tend to go to the Gospels with these Pauline lenses so that the only questions we tend to ask are Pauline ones, right? And I think the most obvious one of these is justification by faith. If you go to the Gospels of justification by faith, you're going to be hard-pressed to find almost anything on it. In fact, interestingly, the only one or two places the word justification even occurs is in the Gospel that was basically Paul's, right? Luke, the, one he, the guy he mentored. And that's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But even in Luke, it's a minor, minor theme, right? The point is when we, we have got to read the Gospels on their own terms, not going to them with our prepackaged Pauline set of important but occasional issues. And we've got to let the Gospels speak for what they're saying. That, that's probably the biggest implication. One more. Dr. Pennington, just... Uh... Maybe two questions. If you can't answer them both, that's okay. Do you think it's unavoidable to read Scripture with a canon within a canon? And if so, would your canon within a canon be the four Gospels? And then the second question is, in light of the fact that the Gospels were written from a post-resurrection perspective, what would that say about the legitimacy of the historical Jesus enterprise? Great, okay. Okay. So the first one, Mark, is what I was just kind of trying to answer there. Uh, you know, can within a canon, them's fighting words, you know, I mean, that's, uh, uh, you know, I, I've used that phrase to be kind of cheeky at one point, but I don't really care that much about it. The, the point is what I've just said, that we all have some ideas and even some texts that we use to orient us to understand scripture, a gestalt, 
Right? We all have some sort of framework that enables us, whether it's Buddhism, that's a fascinating story, I'm gonna use that one about the four incarnations, but we all have a gestalt, we all have a perspective through which we read already. Hopefully we're always growing and spiraling and it's expanding and deepening and getting refined, right? That's the hermeneutical spiral. But we all have that. So instead of acting like we don't, let's just have a conversation about what would be the best one of those to have within scripture. And again, Luther and, Roman, Luther and Calvin make it very clear it's Romans. So all I want to say is, hey, they have a canon within a canon then. I mean, by their own confession, it's fine. I, I'm not convinced that's the best one, but at least it's open to debate. So historical Jesus uh, and post-resurrection documents, I have not, I'm not a huge fan of historical Jesus studies. I don't mean by that that I am opposed to them or not that I don't think there's value, I think there is. I don't think it's the best tool, to use my analogy before. I think that's um, an infrared spectrometer where I would rather have a hammer, right, to sort of get through daily life, right? Or maybe it's a, it's a jackhammer <laughs> when I would rather have a Phillips screwdriver, you know, whatever it is. So, I mean, it's valuable, but you know, there's also different personalities, to be honest with you, and different training. Um, I mean, I, I just don't, I, I'm a literary guy. And so when I read historical Jesus studies, it's, it's fine and I think it benefits. I'm sure it benefits a lot of my reading, but I just get a lot more joy and find a lot more fruit in paying attention to what the text is doing and its artistry. And so it's not an either or, but it's a, I realize there's a personality element to it as well. So thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.